Right now I want to transition to a time of, of reading the scriptures. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. Till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send me from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you now, Lord, we pray, we pray your word back to you. We pray that your glory will go all over the earth today. That right now, Lord, help us to take refuge in you. Help us to seek you. Help us to listen to your voice today. Lord, help us to see the goodness in you. And Lord, help us to respond in the ways that we should respond. Lord, help us to sing praises to you. Lord, I pray that as we sing heartfelt praise to you, that you will hear it as a glad and a glad tiding to your ear. Lord, as the scriptures are read, as the scriptures are preached this morning, Lord, I pray that you will lead us through that, that you will guide us, that you will convict us. Lord, I pray as we, as we leave this place, Lord, I pray that we will not leave the same as we came in, that you will speak to us, you'll guide us, you'll change us. Lord, help us to have more love for you, help us to honor you, and help us to give all glory to you. We ask this in your name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand as we celebrate our Lord this morning and worship him.
gracious Father, again, we just thank you. Uh, Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for um, working toward us, not according to our failures, but according to your promise. And so, Lord, we just ask that you open up our hearts and minds today to receive what you'd like to show us in your scriptures. Holy Spirit, we ask that you encourage and teach. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we know that there are wonderful things that await us. No eye has seen, no ear has heard yet what the Lord has in store for those and where we're headed. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, so this morning we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Galatians called Standing Up for the Truth. Uh, This will be the 10th week focused on this subject, and we're looking to finish Galatians by Easter, uh, on Easter Sunday, and so we've got some ground yet to cover. Uh, And just kind of as, like, you're going to see when you walk out in the foyer, uh, some invite cards. Guys, it's, it, it, Jesus, it's, it's just a wonderful gift to know the Lord. Amen? I think we ought to make it a point to share that gift with other folks. Okay? So Easter's a good time. You, easy, you got an easy foot in the door, a conversation starter to bring somebody into church. But more than, more than bringing them to church, we just want to see the kingdom of God grow. Amen? We want to see people come to know Jesus. So, last week in Galatians, we were reminded that it, we are not our own, we belong to God. We are pilgrims, sojourners, and yes, you could say travelers in this world. And so, this current existence should be viewed as what it is, a, a temporary existence. That doesn't mean that the things we do in this life don't matter, not at all. It, some of the things we do in this life have eternal significance, and life is kind of like a discovery trying to figure that out, but we, we, don't, we don't ultimately belong here. We're made for another world. And so no more sin exists in the new heavens and the new earth. Praise God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So we need to watch out for the gospel presentations that want to add more than to this right here. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. You can't, you don't, we, need, we don't need to add this or the that. And so Paul told us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we got to get bad ideas out of the church like adding to the gospel. And he's going to talk about today a little leaven, a little error, uh, leavens the whole lump. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But again, we belong to God through the gospel. Isaac is a great example. Miracle child given to Sarah in her old age. Nothing, could have, no, nothing of the flesh could have caused Isaac to be born. It was by the Spirit, because it was through the promise of the covenant that God would make Abraham a great nation. And we are part, we are grafted in through the gospel into that great nation. We belong to the city of God. We're the free woman, the Jerusalem above. And so we can boldly say, if we profess Jesus Christ as Lord, whom the Son sets free is what? Free. Free. Amen. We're going to talk about that today. What does it mean to be free? What is Christian freedom? And so as you see there, the sermon title for today is, call, is Called to Liberty. And that might have a double meaning for this congregation here. See, my, my family and I were called to Liberty Church a, couple, a few years back. But if you're a member or you're actively attending uh, this church, then God has called you here in some essence. And so regardless of where God has placed you in the ministry, though, We are all called to liberty, okay? We're all called, not just Liberty Church. Every Christian is called to liberty. And so I want to give a definition of this real quick because this this subject can get so confusing. And I'll say this again later. Christian liberty, if you're a note taker, means we are free from the wages of sin, freed from the power of sin, wages of sin, the power of sin, and and. That doesn't mean we don't struggle with it. That's a different thing. Free from being justified by the law, which is the big context in Galatians. Okay? And then, finally, free to live lives of grace with differing convictions and practices, as long as those practices are not prohibited in the Bible. Okay? So, and, and with that being said, one little note, one little asterisk under that fourth point. 
We, we need to be mindful of our freedom so we don't cause someone else to stumble, okay? We, we, what we don't want, it, it's a balance because we also don't want man-made rules to quench our freedom that we have in Christ. That is a balance. I will come back to that definition again. Christ has given us freedom from sin and freedom to serve. So I want to go ahead. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5, the verse 15 verses. We're going to hit this. And, well, I'd be good and be helpful if I was already there. I was thinking about preaching somewhere else today, I guess. There we go. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Lord, add a blessing to the reading of your word. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit by faith we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers, Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. It's the word of the Lord. That's kind of negative at the end. Negative tone at the end, to say the least. Bite, devour, consume. If you're in the NIV, you might have destroyed uh, there's, a, there's a common theme with these verbs. They're all base, natural, animalistic actions. This is what happens when freedom goes bad. So you think about it, how does a, how does a wild animal, right? How, how does a wild animal, specifically a carnivore, how does it attack its prey? It bites it, right? Tries to stun it. And then it begins to devour it by ripping away. And then finally... After it has died, they begin to consume it. And so Paul is saying that this is what happens when freedom turns into licentiousness. Anything goes, all right? That's, that's, that's not good either. Living in the flesh causes us to look to satisfy the self. If everyone is only concerned with their own needs, love is not present, and selfish ambition, doing whatever I want, can show itself in ugly ways. So true liberty is kind of this tightrope between two ledges. And on one end, you've got legalism, uh, the Jesus and stuff. And on the other end, you've got licentiousness, where it's just like, I'm going to do whatever I want. And somewhere in the middle, we find Christian liberty. We should be bold in our freedom, right? Bold in our Christian freedom, because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen? Amen. No condemnation to those who are in Christ. We don't deal in the realm of condemnation. That's the devil's work. We deal in the realm of conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts and guides. And so we've got to remember the context of this letter so that we know what we're talking about here. So the, the, the Judaizers, these are the false brothers, false teachers. They're coming in and doing what we'll call gospel or promoting what we'll call gospel add-ons. They were adding to the message of Christ. It wasn't simply repent and believe. It was also, by the way, you need to follow the ceremonial law in the Old Testament. You need to receive the sign of circumcision. And you need to become more Jewish to be a Christian. Okay? More Jewish in your understanding. And if you really want to get saved, you need to be like us. When you have that kind of party present, you have to wonder, well, maybe, maybe they're well-meaning. Right? Maybe they're just mistaken. Guys, sometimes people do things and it's flagrantly on purpose. Not, a, not everybody is innocent. And the Bible tells us in Galatians, we got two little insights into the character of these folks. 
in, in verse, you don't have to turn here, but in, in chapter 2, 4, it says that these folks came in so that they might bring us into slavery. There's an action. Not a great, not a great plan. And then again, uh, in, and we did this a couple weeks ago, chapter 4, verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out so that you make much of them. So they want to put you under a yoke of bondage. At the same time, they want you to be followers of them. And so there's deception to get a following, not, not great intentions. And so compare that with what Jesus taught. Compare that with Jesus. The heart of Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said he wanted weary souls burdened by the law to be free and to find rest. Amen? Some of y'all, this is your favorite, one of your favorite passages. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so take, take yoke, drawn, a yoke would be a... a a, a device drawn around an ox or a bull used to carry a, a load, right, a cart. And so metaphorically, uh, rabbis would use the, the law, they would use a yoke as an illustration, like a yoke of bondage, the, the weight of the law. And, and that's to describe the heaviness of it, because it is heavy. And Jesus' yoke is easy because he bears the weight of the law that we can't. And so thus we, we find rest for our souls under the name of Jesus for our salvation. We don't have to play this Jesus and game. We can have rest in Jesus through the simple gospel, repent and believe. That's why Paul begins this section reminding us and the Galatians that we belong to Jesus and there is freedom in Jesus. And he says this, verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not submit again. Do not turn back to the stuff that Jesus came to set you free from. Resist the lies of false brothers that would push circumcision for salvation. So we've been set free to have freedom. Free for freedom. What kind of freedom? So when we think of freedom in the States, this is okay, guys. I mean, we've got to have to take the benefit of the doubt. We're Americans, okay? When we think about freedom, we're preconditioned not to jump straight to Christian freedom. We're preconditioned to jump to America, 1776. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble. And hey, here's the deal. I'm not... I love America, and I'm so thankful for this country and the freedom it affords its citizens. I'm proud to be an American in the sense of, you know, not prideful, but proud in the, in the best way of using the phrase. Uh, but I wouldn't try to compare it to the freedom that Jesus gives. I wouldn't compare that to Christian liberty. Okay, it was totally different. Different ballpark, different game. And that brings us to the first point. Christian freedom is the best kind of freedom we can ever experience. Best of respects to the founding fathers, but Christian freedom is the best kind of freedom we can ever experience. Doesn't matter your country, this is why. It goes beyond America. It doesn't matter your country. It doesn't matter your demographic or the cards you've been dealt in life. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It goes beyond all those things. This freedom frees us from the, from also from the so-called freedoms that we think we have. Christian liberty, again, is freedom from sin to serve God. When we repent, what are we doing? We're turning away from our sin. We're turning to God. That's a good way of thinking about liberty for Christians. We get, we get the power to turn away from sin, and we get the power to serve God. And so freedom to do good and the glory of God and to see life in a whole bright new way. The world attacks this kind of freedom, tries to flip it around. Religions, including Christianity, are the real bondage. Right? 
They shake their hands at you. You guys follow a set of rules. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. You got to do whatever your master tells you to do. And they can't see the chains. They don't have the spiritual eyes to see the chains dangling from their arms while they're shaking their hands of freedom at you. You see, they don't have the eyes to see. They don't have the ears to hear. And they've been fooled by the enemy in the flesh. And so the Judaizers were also trying to fool the Galatians. And in verses 2 and 3, this is what, they, what, this is what Paul says. I say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. All right, ratcheting it up. He's not talking about, you know, it's like, and you, and you might, if you're not familiar, f- familiar with the Old Testament, like, why is everybody always talking about circumcision? What's the deal? Well, that's because that was the sign of the covenant given to Abraham, okay? Sign of the Jewish people. But under the new covenant, Paul had promoted and the, and the apostles promoted uh, through Jesus' teaching that this was no longer binding on the conscience of New Testament believers in Jesus. Because the argument became, if you're not circumcised, can you be saved? And some people thought yes, and others thought no. But the point is, the gospel, for the gospel to have consistency, the gospel is simply repent and believe the gospel, not repent, believe the gospel, and be more Jewish. That's not it. You're adding to the law. And so, you've got a straightforward question here. If you do this, you try to justify yourself by cutting yourself, a little bit of irony, Jesus counts for nothing to you. Remember, this is, this is a question of how we are right with God. Okay, how are we right with God? Do, we, do you, Christian brother, sister, do you believe you need more than the gospel to be right with God? That's what's the, what the question is. You see, Christianity isn't, you know, half me and half God. We got together, made a transaction because I made the right decision, and now I'm saved. That's not Christianity. And it's not even a whole lot of Jesus and a little bit of me. That's not Christianity either. It's 100% Jesus. Jesus did it all from beginning to end. Jesus saves. No middle point. Uh, It's not me and God working together to save me. Yes, I call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And what he's done, or what I did, and I can turn turn away from my sin that I was dead in and believe, or I can reject him. If we refuse to listen to the Holy Spirit, if we accept the method of merit, that is what I've done, look at the things that I've done, this is why I should be saved, uh, we are obligated, that's what the, the apostle's saying here, we are obligated to keep the whole law, which no one but Jesus has ever been able to do. Paul writes in Romans, if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. See, this is about more than circumcision, is the point. This is about how you view the gospel. Try to add to the gospel, and you always end up taken away. James 2.10 Many of you probably have that underlined in your Bible. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Is the law bad? Is the law bad? It can make me feel bad. But the law is not bad. When we're trying to be saved by the law, that's when it becomes bad to us. It turns into that legalism. So, verse 4, you are severed from Christ. Again, these these words, you're cut off. Cut off, that's the, that's the key word. And it, it's clever, because these guys are so obsessed with cutting. You would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. It should never be falling away from grace. We should always be running toward it. We should always be swimming toward grace. It's grace that's brought us safe thus far, and grace is leading us home. Amen? Life for the Christian is all of grace. Verse 5, through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Love that word. The hope of righteousness. So you see, we have a great hope. We're declared we're now righteous now, right, right now. If you believe in Jesus, you are righteous right now. But that righteousness is going to be realized in a fuller capacity when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead. 
and we receive glorified bodies. It's going to be a beautiful day. What a glorious, glorious day that will be. So you have to, you have to question yourself, though. Like, what is, what is your hope built on? What are you hoping in today? What is it? It's everything. How do you find hope to keep going when you're, in a, when you're dealing with a difficult situation in and out, day in and out, day out? Is your hope like, I hope it rains? Is it that uncertainty? Because that's not the hope that we have. The hope we have is sure and steadfast. The hope we have is my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I don't trust the sweetest frame. That is, I don't trust circumcision or these things I do or whatever it is. I trust Jesus and Jesus alone. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' debt. My weary load was borne by him and he alone can give me rest. Beautiful. Christ, again, is like a sure and steady anchor carrying us through the ups and downs of this life into the next. That's why we have joy for today, bright hope for tomorrow. We don't have to wait to heaven to celebrate what's in heaven. We can celebrate heavenly things right now. It's a foretaste of glory. It's a beautiful thing to do. So we live with hearts full of hope. We grieve as those who have hope when we suffer loss. Because, verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. I love this verse, because this is the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom of God right here, coming through. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why does he say circumcision or uncircumcision? What's, what's that? We haven't been talking about that. We've been talking about these guys that want to Get circumcised. I want everybody to do it. I thought the issue was circumcision for salvation. So why both here? Because God knows how quickly the human heart can begin to boast in what we do, but not just what we do, in the things that we don't do. Because after all, if I don't do it, I'm right and my way's better. But if I decide to do it, I'm still right and my way's better. We're so inclined to that kind of thinking. Like if you have something, uh, this happened all the time when I was a kid. Like you talked about, yeah, like, like when I got older, it turned into trucks. When we were kids, it was like game systems. Like what's better, Xbox or PlayStation, man? Oh, uh, uh, Xbox. We find out that guy's got an Xbox. You know, it's like when you get older, it's like what's better, uh, Ford or Chevy? <laughs> Chevrolet, man, found on road ditch. You know, you know, go into that kind of stuff. Why? Because that guy had a Chevy. That's what it came down to. And so we have the, we're, we're so prone to identify with the, like, how we feel about things, which is to be human, I guess. But we got to watch out for naturally wanting to align with things, whether we do them or not, so that we can boast or be proud for, in a spiritual way for not doing it. So we can actually boast in uncircumcision just as much as we can boast in circumcision. Wow. Three times in the New Testament, Paul says this, neither uncircumcision or, or circumcision. I'll, I'll tell you, one, another one's later in Galatians. He says, that, he adds this on, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation, a new creation. Then he says it again in Corinthians 7. It says, neither circumcision, uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Okay? So we got keeping the commandments, new creation. Keeping commandments, wait, wait that's, that's a little off what we're, kilter with what we're talking about here. No, it's a different topic, different crowd. We know that Christian freedom, freedom is not liberation so that I don't have to do anything. What, what kind of existence is that anyway? It's, it's an invitation to the best and most fulfilling type of serving that this life has to offer. You see, we get to, it's all like you get, gotta get that, gotta get that, that have to to the get to. We get to live to the glory of God in whatever we do. We get to share King Jesus with others. Jesus is too good to not be shared, right? He's too good to not be shared. We should not be keeping Jesus to ourselves. So if you've experienced the life transforming power of Jesus, shouldn't we want everyone to experience that? Do we believe the gospel that we preach? 
if we really believe the Bible, we ought to tell everyone what's available. Freedom from sin to serve. I know I kind of glossed over what's here. Faith working through love. Love fueled by faith. You got that faith working through love at the end of this verse. We only know how to love God because God showed us what love is. Amen? God showed us what love is. How how did he demonstrate his love toward us? While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Faith affirms love and answers the questions, you know, that we have about life, you know. Um, whether you're asking the question or whether you're listening to foreigners say, I want to know what love is, Jesus has an answer, okay? And a you know, foreigner might have been talking about a different kind of love. But the best love, God's love, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're introduced to it. Sometimes the enemy and his subjects take our eyes off the gospel and we're tempted to look back at our own accomplishments and we stumble. See, the Galatians were following well after they had received the gospel, but something else happened. That's verse 7. You were running well. Picture, picture somebody running down, a, down the baseline or, or down a track, and they're, just, they're hoofing it, man. They're getting it. And then they hit a rock or something and fall. And they stumbled. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You were in step with our teaching. You were getting it. Then someone cut you off. What happened? That kind of stuff, verse 8, doesn't come from him who calls you. Doesn't come from God. God doesn't do that. The Bible says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. God doesn't cause us to stumble. He keeps us from it. He is working, changing us. He's working in us, changing us from glory to glory. But the flesh and the devil, they want to get in the way. And so a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's where he goes with it. Little leaven. Error, what this means is error leads to more error in this context. Yeast, like yeast spreading through a piece of bread. Marie has been making homemade bread. Keep doing it, honey. You can put some leaven in that bread. All right? It's so good. But if you look at, if you get your ingredients out to make bread, yeast, not a whole lot of it. It doesn't take a whole lot of it to make its effect. Go. And what does it do to the bread? It expands it. And so if you have something expanding in your midst, it better be something good and not an error. We can spread good things. We can also spread bad things. The Judaizers were spreading bad things. And so we need to be on the lookout for deception. How do we do that? Second point. Second point. The Bible guides us away from error and shows us how to love. Away from error shows us how to love. Two sides here. We're privileged to have this right here. You know if you have this, you are living at a very privileged time in history. I'm not talking about the English Standard Version Bible. I'm talking about the Bible. Whatever you have. The early church had to go on teaching, on the teaching of the apostles, like letters like Galatians, like what we're studying right now, would not have been like, oh, here's a copy for you. We don't hand them out like, like lyrics to a song we're getting ready to sing. No, they would have been read aloud by an individual, circulated, shared, because that's all they had. And so for centuries, a personal Bible was not something available to everyone, and only a select amount of, them, of folks had access to the Word of God. But later on, Gutenberg's Press, I'm giving you the very Sparks Notes version of this, Gutenberg's Press came along. Eventually, more and more circulation started to happen. More and more copies, copies were made of the 66 books of the Bible. And we've got what we have right here in a translation that we can read and understand. Past generations, guys, would long to have opportunities to have what we have. Right here. They had the technology or the culture that we're in. And so here's a challenge just on that thought. How much time do you spend reading your Bible? And now control and compare that to something. Okay, give it some legs. I don't know how much free time you have. Compare that to how much time you do something else. Like, I don't know, look at Facebook. 
Are you, are you on equal? No. It's, and, and that's okay. It's easier to access such things. But I mean, you can put your app on your phone. You can put your, your Bible on your phone nowadays. And so I was encouraged by something. And I'm, guys, I'm not like Mr. King Bible plan. That's, I'm not up here boasting to you. I, I mess up with this too. But the point is we have this, and, and I was encouraged by this. Carolyn told me that uh, she and Roy used to read the Bible together, together once a year. And every night they would talk about what they read. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. It's a great testimony. Because the Bible helps us to identify the error or the kind of leaven that was being presented when it shows up. If you're not well, if you're not well versed in your Bible, then you're going based on the whim of what somebody else says to you or what somebody else shows you. You should be checking what I say. You know that? You should be checking what I say. If I'm not in line with, the, with what the Bible's saying, I need to stop talking. Sometimes like, well, does it, do you only have to not be in line with the Bible saying to stop talking? Is there any other way? <laughs> so we're led by the Spirit, and the apostles are formed, uh, the apostles' teaching was formed by the Spirit. The whole Trinity was involved with this. And all the words of the Bible are the words of God, all of them. And so verse 10, got to keep going. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. You've got a troublemaker, and God's going to deal with him, is, the, is what's being said here. We should always pray that folks will repent. Amen? We always want folks to repent. We don't want people to receive justice. At, at the end of the time, we're going to receive one or the other. It's going to be justice or mercy, and I hope that you're opting for mercy. Because when it comes to Jesus and his kingdom, you don't want to get what you deserve. You don't want to get justice. All right. Warning. Trigger warning, people. Yeah, that's, is that a millennial thing? Anyway, warning. This passage, this gets a little, you know, graphic. But the Bible isn't PG. All right, the Bible isn't PG. If I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In, that, in the case the offense of the cross has been removed, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Whoa. Whoa. Ratchet it up, Brother Paul. This is probably the most shocking thing that he, that he's ever, that he ever penned in the Bible. And he's making the point that he's catching flack for coming against these folks that want to separate, that want to make distinction between Jew and Gentile. Didn't want us to all just be one in Christ. We wanted to have like a tier system. Like here's the, the really cool inside club and here's all the people. These people are okay and then these guys are far off. Paul was trying to fight that. And so th this colorful language, that I'm, that's what we'll call it, is supposed to be poetically shocking, but that was also a pagan practice. Okay, pagans did that kind of thing. And pagans would have been thought of by these folks as being cut off from the kingdom of God. So the, so the irony here with talking about cutting for circumcision, go the rest of the way, cut yourself off from God. That's what he's trying to say. Pretty fierce. And so these additions, the reason being is these additions to the work of Jesus are bondage and they're not what we're called to. What are we called to? For you were called to freedom, liberty, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Jesus is your liberty. Jesus is my liberty. Amen? I am free forever because of Jesus. We aren't called by the message of I did it. That's not it. Or Jesus and I did it. That's not the message either. We were called through the liberty of the gospel, and that is Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. We rest in the work of God. We take his yoke upon ourselves and we learn from Jesus we take on his righteousness it is finished there's nothing left to add to his work you, there is nothing that you do for your salvation that will contribute to the work that was accomplished on the cross Jesus lived died and rose again and paid for all of your sin and lives though that we may die yet shall we live through him 
It's an amazing thing. We cannot add to that. Anything you try to put on it, you're just putting a blemish on it, okay? It's perfect the way it is. Leave it alone. So what is this? Uh, Paul tells us here what, what freedom doesn't look like, giving opportunity to the flesh. So here we come back again to this idea, this licentiousness and legalism. So what, what is giving opportunity to the flesh? It's the idea that uh, if Jesus paid it all, Jesus did it all, I'm going to do whatever I want, okay? I'm going to live however I want. Guys, the Lord sees the heart. Honestly, how could a heart that's tasted and seen that the Lord is good even consider such a thought? That's how I, that's how I come to I approach this subject. So, I know this is a difficult subject. Think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm free in Christ, so now... I'm going to do all those things that used to enslave me. We are free, amen? But don't be fooled. We're always bound to something. You're always mastered by something. It's inevitable as as a human. We're wired to be worshiping servants, and the wire that's been shorted out is the one when it comes to our loves and desires. And so we will serve and worship what we love by nature. Freedom, uh, Jesus gives, fixes that problem. Put like like tying a wire nut, two wires together. Fixes the connection and and, and the problem and gives us the proper desires. That's why when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he changes the desires of our hearts. And And then this next verse. So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Quoting Leviticus. Loving God and loving others is freedom from being self absorbed. Why do, you, why do you think he would go to loving others in this context? Because he wants you to get your mind off yourself. And the Bible, despite what the culture says, the Bible always assumes that you will love yourself. The Bible always assumes that we love ourselves. That doesn't mean you're always happy with yourself. That's not what that means. It means that you will, by nature, have some inkling of love for yourself. Because the Bible is true, and let God be true, and every man a liar. Amen? Here, we got, if you, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You can, and, and so this is showing that, the, assuming that people will, who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good will begin to consider the needs of others above their own. That's what happens. Man, is that unpopular today. Man, is that so unpopular today. You talk about that and you get a, death by a thousand quarters. Right? But, 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 but nothing. Let God, trust God, guys. If God says, quit focusing, you, you realize when you start focusing on yourself so much that you get lost in the mirror and you can't even see past yourself to see the cross. Kill it. You don't have to focus on yourself. You get to focus on God. You get to serve other people. It's a beautiful thing and amazing something amazing happens when you do it. Joy begins to well up in your heart. Now, that's not going to sell. That's not going to sell at the stores. I understand that. But you are free to not believe that lie. You are free to not believe that you have to focus so much of your efforts on your own personal happiness because when you seek the happiness of you you seek what God tells you to seek when you seek to love him and to love your neighbor something amazing happens you're filled with joy you're filled with peace beautiful thing worship team come on up Christian liberty here's the definition again I said I'd say it again means we are free from the wages of our sin freed from the power of sin, free from being justified by the law, free to live lives of grace with differing convictions and practices, as long as those things are not prohibited by the Bible. Mindful of freedoms, guys, so we don't cause somebody else to stumble. Christian liberty is the best kind of liberty we can experience because it gives us the ability to live in the best way possible. Free to see, 
free to pursue, free from stumbling, free from error, free to love, free to serve. Have you received the call of liberty that's available in Jesus that frees you from the rat race and frees you from the lies of the world? The world promises you freedom, but it can't give what it doesn't have. God promises you liberty, and he is more than happy to give you the liberty that he has through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day of grace. Thank you for your word. Help us to believe your word over the world. Help us to trust you. Help us to not subscribe to the Jesus and, but to trust, to be able to say from the heart, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Help us to believe you more than anything else and to increase our faith today. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, please. love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God.
of the goodness of God. good and faithful. Amen? Amen. You know, um, hey, can I hold you up for a couple more minutes? Let's see. Let me just say, that, say it this way. Um, I, I had no intentions of railing on self-love versus the love for God and love your neighbor so much just now, but I want to quarter that with something and something I've noticed, uh, that the people that we often have the kindest things to say about are usually those that are that way, Okay. And so yesterday at that funeral, I got to see uh, Roy and Carolyn's son and daughter get up and talk about how much they love their dad. And it, all of it was because of that sacrifice element, okay? The, if, the giving, the other-centered thing. And, I mean, honestly, it's one of the reasons we praise Jesus so much, isn't it? Because Jesus, although he was in the form of God, didn't consider that something to be grass. It gave up that gave up what he had in order to come and ransom us and wash the feet, dirty disciple feet. Just amazing to think about, isn't it? Anyway, go and love one another and serve the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.